Hello again. Good afternoon. Get your authorized version of the scriptures, the King James scriptures, the true and real scriptures. And turn in your authorized version of the scriptures to Matthew chapter 1. The title and the thumbnail, which I do not have yet, I'm going to find one before I upload this, um, is going to give you give it away what this video is about. I'm going to be addressing Christmas. Now, I was asked of this by a brother, and um, <clears throat> I have not answered it. I've, I've actually had the notes for this for a while, but... I have not been given the green light to do this video. Um, some of you might find this strange to believe, but I will not do a video or upload anything unless I know for certain that it is the Lord's will. I take this very seriously. Very seriously. So, we're going to be looking at Christmas, what it is and where it came from. And also we are going to be looking at scriptures debunking quite a bit of this. Okay, also for this video, I'm going to be, ha uh, there are some resources I'm going to use for this video. I'm going to be using the, uh, the Catholic Bible, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, okay? And also going to be reading um, a part of a chapter from The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. Okay? Going to be reading to you a portion out of this. Uh, just so you know, I have a PDF on my channel for The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. This is the unabridged version of the two Babylons, okay? Unabridged, the whole sandwich. There is a abridged version that doesn't have the whole sandwich. This is a book done of men that it's not needful for you to read, but it would benefit you greatly. Church of the Living God, especially when it comes on to knowing of the horror, Mystery Babylon the Great, Roman Catholicism, it is very helpful for you to have this book uh, and to read it and to, um, to it'll teach you many things about Mystery Babylon, okay? <clears throat> They, <laughs> they say, they attribute that Christmas, Christ Mass, hello, that Christmas is the celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ our Lord, and that he was born on December 25th. And Christmas trees and Satan Claus, I'm not even going to get into Satan Claus. Okay, and very quickly about Satan Claus. Okay, he knows who's been naughty or good. He gives gifts to those who are good, but to those who are bad, he gives a lump of coal in their stocking. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, and also too about Satan Claus, you do this on your own time. Google search Black Pete, you know, Santa's little helper. Go ahead and look into that. And listen, if you are a child, um, guess what? Maybe your mother and father aren't telling you this, okay? There is no Santa Claus. Oh, Brad! Oh, shh, 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 shh. <laughs> okay? There is no Santa Claus. Okay? 
It is not okay for you to lie to your children about Santa Claus. Whether you are lost or of the Church of the Living God. Okay, and that that's that's enough about that. I'm not going to be talking about that. Going to be addressing. Let's first address. And primarily, the December 25th thing. Okay, the December 25th thing. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 on to verse 25. We begin. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 on to verse 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David. Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Not Emmanuel. Jesus. Okay? For he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord spoken of by spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying behold a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted God with us then Joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn, her firstborn son, and called his name Jesus. Okay? Now, go to Luke chapter 2. Now, here's where we're going to get into the nitty gritty. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verses 1, on to verse 16. <clears throat> and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. Now, you can historically look up when this taxing, this taxing came about. You can dig online for it, and um, you can uh, research about Caesar Augustus and when the time of this taxing was done. Okay, that is something helpful that you can do on your own time. Okay, and you will come to find out that in reality, it is between anywhere between September and October, wherein these events would have happened. Why is that significant? Let's keep reading. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with, his, with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Catholics say that Mary was a perpetual virgin. That's a lie. 
That's a lie. Okay. Well, don't worry. We'll, we'll, we'll get more into the historical aspects of that a little later. Okay. Okay. Let's read that again. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in a swaddle in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And when they and they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. Now there is also something to take in consideration about the shepherds in the field. But again, when you look into the historical accounts of when this taxing was, December twenty fifth. It's like, where did they get that? We're going to look at where they got that, okay? But it wasn't December. And it certainly was not December 25th. Now, now, okay, let us go back now to Matthew, Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, verses 26, on to verse 29. Why are we looking at this? Okay, why are we looking at this? Matthew chapter 26, verses 26, on to verse 29. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it, and brake it. And gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Okay, okay, and with that also, okay, with that also, go to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, verses 22, on to verse 24. Check this out. Mark, cha uh, Mark chapter 14, verses 22, on to verse 24. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it, and gave it to them, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is, the, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Okay, and one more. Go to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, verses 19 and on to verse 20. 19 on to verse 20 in Luke chapter 22. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Communion. 
which is a time of self-examination. Okay? Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, this, is, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Why did we look at this? Why did we look at this? First and foremost, can you show me in the scriptures, the authorized version of the scriptures, where we are, com are commanded to commemorate or celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Where God was manifest in the flesh, you know, the Word made flesh, okay? Can you please show me in the New Testament, anywhere, where it says that we are to observe the birth of Jesus Christ? Put, put the scriptures, not your opinions. Put the scriptures in the comment section. Put them there. Show it to me. Okay? Ever wonder why that is? Well, look at what Christmas is. Okay? Is there anything concerning the Lord Jesus Christ that we are to keep in memory and to commemorate? We just looked at it. The Lord's Supper. Communion. A time of self-examination. Okay? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We will be reading verses 17 on to verse 34. Okay? Go there. Now, I have a video addressing this. Uh, the Blessed Cookie, I believe it's called. Okay? An older video where we go through this. I'm going to link it in this video. Okay? Watch that. It's an older video. Okay? Anyway. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 on to verse 34. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly, in this confidence of bo boasting. Oops, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I had 2 Corinthians. It's 1 Corinthians. I'm sorry, brethren. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're, you're reading Brad. What? It's, I'm sorry. Okay. 1 <laughs> Corinthians chapter 17 on to verse 34. 1 Corinthians. Boop. Beg your pardon. Okay. Now this, uh, now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not. That ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. You shall know them by their fruits. When ye come to get, uh, together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, every one taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry. And another is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God? And shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This 
do in remembrance of me. Now these 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 people teach you that the sun-shaped bale cookie and the wine that becomes blood through transubstantiation is a requirement for your salvation. Don't don't tell me they don't. Yes, they do. Okay, that's how the Catholic receives Jesus by eating him by the magic hocus pocus transubstantiation, the round bale cookie, the sun shaped S U N uh, shaped cookie becomes flesh and the wine becomes blood. Cannibals, okay, okay, they that's what that is. You read this, that is what they teach you, okay. It is for remembrance. Not salvation. Okay, it's a timer. Let's continue. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. Commemorating his death. Remembering his death, what he has done for you on the cross. Okay? This is in the Pauline epistles, by the way, which is doctrine for us today in, the, uh, in this dispensation, uh, the time of the Gentiles. Okay? This is for us today. Okay? Now let's continue. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Here's the, here's the uh, defining thing for verse 27. But let a man examine himself. Examine himself. How do you examine yourself? Through the scriptures. Through the scriptures. Okay? But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. There. Self-examination in remembering what the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, did for you on the cross. Okay, how he died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That he shed his blood to make atonement for your sin and for mine. Okay? Okay? Now let's continue. Verse 30. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. And if you don't have chastening, scriptures say that you are a bastard, not knowing whom your father is. That's in Hebrews. Go find it. Okay? But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. So the Lord's Supper is a time of examination. And remembering what the Lord has done for you. Now you of the Church of the Living God, you know right well that every single solitary day, with every single breath, you are to give thanks unto the Lord for all things, every single day, for what He did for you on the cross. But when it comes to this, communion, okay? It is a time of self-examination because if you do it unworthily, trying to have communion, you know, remembering the Lord Jesus Christ for what he did for you on the cross and you are in sin, out of fellowship, 
For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Many sleep. Dead. Okay? This. This is something that we are told to do. Communion. Self-examination. Not his birth. His death. His death. That Christ did. First Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Okay? It says death. The New Testament begins with the death of the testator. That's also in Hebrews. Go find it. Okay? It's the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, not his birth. Because by his death, burial, and resurrection, by the blood he shed on the cross, by coming to him broken and contrite, believing on him for what he has done for us, and in that broken and contrite state, Believing on him, we call upon the name of the Lord. It happens. We are saved. Okay? Because God looks upon the heart if it, if it is a broken or contrite heart. You know what I mean? But the whole point is, brethren, again, show me. Show me Show me where we are com to commemorate his birth. Show it to me. Show it to me. And not rather his death. Show it to me. Show it to me. It's not there. Show it to me. Okay? Now also too... There's something to do about this tree thing. Um, uh, well, for starters, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16. Deuteronomy chapter uh, 16, we will be reading verses 21 and verse 22. You know, the Christmas tree thing, right? Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 21 on to verse 22. Thou shalt not plant thee a grove of any trees near unto the altar of the Lord thy God, which thou shalt make thee. Neither shalt thou set thee up any image which the Lord thy God hateth. And when you look into what a grove is, you do that on your own time. There's some problems there. Okay? Go to Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10. Yes, we're going to read this whole chapter. Can you handle that? Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, 
and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O King of nations? For to thee doth it appertain, for as much as among all the wise men of the nations, and in all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. Okay? Silver spread into plates is brought from Tarshish, and gold from Euphaz, the work of the workmen, and the hands of the founder. Blue and purple is their clothing. They are all the work, they are all the work of the of cunning men. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God. And and an everlasting king. At his wrath the earth shall tremble, and the nations shall not be able to abide his indignation. Thus shall you say unto them, The gods, little g, that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth, and from under these heavens. He hath made the earth by his power, he hath established the world by his wisdom, and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain, and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. Every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image. <clears throat> For his molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. They are vanity and the work of errors. In their time, in the time of their visitation, shall they perish. The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he, for he is the former of all things. And Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Gather up thy wares out of the land, O inhabitant of the forest, of the Fortress, excuse me. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will sling out the inhabitants of the land at this once, and will distress them, that they may find it so. Woe is me for my hurt. My wound is grievous. But I said, Truly, this is a grief, and I must bear it. My tabernacle is spoiled, and all my cords are broken. My children are gone forth of me. And they are not. There is none to stretch forth my tent any more, and to set up my curtains. For the pastors are become brutish, and have not sought the Lord. Therefore they shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. Behold, the noise of the brute has come, and a great commotion out of the north country, to make the cities of Judah desolate, and a den of dragons. O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in, in, in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. O Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger lest thou bring me to nothing. Pour 
out thy fury upon the heathen that know thee not, and upon the families that call not upon thy name. For they have eaten up Jacob and devoured him, and consumed him, and have made his habitation desolate. Looking over here, back in Jeremiah chapter 10, <clears throat> verses 1 under verse 5 again, I wanted to read that whole chapter for you, okay, about the seriousness of this. Again, Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 1 under verse 5, Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen. And be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them, for the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born, because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them. For they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. So, uh, decorating a tree, having a tree in your house, celebrating the birth of Jesus, when in reality, it is not December 25th. If anything, through study on your own time and looking up historical documents and stuff like that, you're going to come around the conclusion somewhere between September and October. But there is a reason why the actual date of the birth of our Lord is not given you. Because look what they have done. Okay? Okay, and some will be, say something about, well, there's talk about giving gifts, you know, what, the giving gifts, right? I, I, I have to address that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, and I've, I've, I've come across this before. Go to Esther chapter 9, one verse, Esther chapter 9, okay? Esther chapter 9, verse 22. This is about the um, Jewish day of Purim. Purim, which is still celebrated today amongst the Jews. Okay? Verse 22 in Esther chapter 9. As the days were in the Jews rested from their enemies, and the month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy, and from mourning into a good day, that they should make them days of feasting and joy, and sending portions one to another, and gifts to the poor. Yes! Yes! Feasting and joy! Yes! But it's from the... It was what? That the Jews were delivered from their enemies? Delivered from their enemies? And why did Jesus Christ come here? Why was God manifest in the flesh? To die on the cross for your sins and my sins. He came as the king of the Jews to offer unto the Jews the kingdom of heaven, which they rejected, which is prophesied that they would do. And that he, Jesus Christ, the suffering servant, would die, bury, and rise again the third day according to the scriptures. And that his blood shed on that cross is the payment for your sins. The blood of God. Okay? Hence, by the death, burial, and resurrection, by the blood that our Lord Jesus Christ shed on the cross, and by our faith on him, for what he has done for us, broken and contrite sinners, okay? We are delivered from our enemies, from our enemy. 
at the birth. Okay? And some will talk about, I have made mention about, you know, how they're giving gifts to each other over the death of the two witnesses. I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to touch that because if you're going to use that as a means to justify giving gifts on Christ Mass, um, the one that is located in Revelation because of the death of the two witnesses, still, that that's pretty, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not even going to touch that. Okay? I had to address this. The Jews were delivered from their enemies. Okay? People died. Okay? Hence also, Jesus Christ died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Okay? Again, we are not told anywhere in the scriptures to celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. You show me in the New Testament. Show it to me. Show it to me. We're not commanded anywhere to celebrate his birth, but if anything, more rather to remember his death, burial, and resurrection. Okay? Okay? Is death. And when it comes to, for example, of Easter, I have two videos about Easter called Easter, um, Easter Lenten Eggs. I will link them in this video as well. Okay. But I want to share something with you now. Okay. About this. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6. Verses 14 on to verse 18. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And on that, Isaiah chapter 52, Isaiah chapter 52, Isaiah chapter 52, verse 11, and verse 12. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing, go ye out of the midst of her. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. For ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your re reward. And of course, Revelation chapter 18, Revelation chapter 18, talking about the destruction of Mystery Babylon, Rome. Catholicism, Revelation in chapter 18, verse 4, and verse 5. And I heard another voice from heaven, 
saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Her iniquities. Who is this her? Ah, uh, Revelation chapter 17, verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Who is that? Rome. Roman Catholicism. Okay? Okay? Now, reading from the Catholic Bible. Hmm. This will be on page 142 of the Catholic Catechism. Um, and we will be reading, or I will be reading on to you, their paragraphs 525 and 526. Okay? Um, now, I know that you might not see this too clearly, but I, I have to do it. From where my finger is down to right here, okay, that is what I am reading you. Okay? That is what I'm reading you. The Christmas Mystery. Jesus was born in a humble stable in a poor family, into a poor family. Simple shepherds were the first witnesses to this event. In this poverty, heaven's glory was made manifest. The church never try, tires of singing the glory of this night. O oh, capital V, Virgin! Oh, the Virgin today brings into the world the Eternal. The Virgin, with the capital V. And the earth offers a cave to the inaccessible. The angels and shepherds praise him, and the magi advance with the star. For you are born for us, little child, God Eternal. Yeah. Born for us. Unto us a child is given. Now check this out. This is so, this is so Jesuit. Jesuit, Catholic, one and the same, especially nowadays. To become a child in relation to God is the condition for entering the kingdom. For this we must humble ourselves and become little. Even more, to become children of God we must be born from above, or born of God. Only when Christ is formed in us will the mystery of Christmas be fulfilled in us. <laughs> you shall be as gods. Knowing good and evil, right? Yeah. <laughs> the mystery of Christmas be fulfilled in us. <laughs> Christmas is the mystery of this marvelous exchange. Oh, marvelous exchange. Man's creator has become man born of the capital V, Virgin. We have been made sharers in the divinity of Christ who humbled himself to share our humanity. <clears throat> yeah, okay, that's enough. Very brief that they give, at least in that heading of Christ Mass, okay? And any of, and you know, any of you, even you enemies, you know that on to the Catholic Christmas is whoa, 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 that's really big to them. Okay. Now, um, oh, I'm not putting that away. Excuse me. Um, now, just before we continue, um, 
I'm not attacking any of you who decide to, you know, decide to do things on Christmas. But you really got to keep in mind from whence this thing, Christ Mass, came from. It did not come from the scriptures. That is for certain. Christ Mass Christmas did not come from the scriptures. I'm sorry to break that to you. It did not. Now, I'm going to be reading to you out of the two Babylons, the unabridged version, okay? Or the unabridged copy. All right? I have, like I said, I have a link for the PDF for the two Babylons on my channel. Go find it, okay? It would be profitable onto you. Now, I'm going to read this verbatim, and there are, I'm going to show you because there are some pictures and stuff like that. Uh, I've got a little bit to read here, okay? Just a little bit to read, but uh, we will get through it, okay? Okay? This is on, this begins chapter 3, which is on page 91, and I'm going to be reading on to page 103. Okay? And I'm going to be doing this verbatim. If I trip over my words or something like that with pronunciation, sometimes I have trouble with that. Please bear with me. Chapter 3, Festivals, Section 1, Christmas and Lady Day, capital V, Virgin, the Roman Catholic Mary, Semiramis, that, okay. If Rome be indeed the Babylon of the Apocalypse, and the Madonna enshrined in her sanctuaries be the very Queen of Heaven, for the worshipping of whom the fierce anger of God was provoked against the Jews in the days of Jeremiah. It is of the last, conse it is of the last consequence that the fact should be established beyond all po possibility of doubt, for that being once established, everyone who trembles at the word of God must shudder at the very thought of giving such a system, either individually or nationally, nationally, the least countenance or support. Something has been said already that goes far to prove the identity of the Roman and Babylonian systems, but at every step the evidence becomes still more overwhelming. That which arises from com Comparing the different festivals is peculiar, peculiarly so, peculiarly, excuse me, so. Sorry for that. The festivals of Rome are innumerable. Yeah. But five of the most important may be singled out for Elucudation, 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 I'm sorry, <laughs> uneducated. Elucudation, viz. Christmas Day, Lady Day, Easter, the Nativity of St. John, and the Feast of the Assumption. Each and all of these can be proved to be Babylonian. And first, as to the festival in honor of the birth of Christ or Christmas. 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 How comes it that the festival was connected with the 25th of December? And amen. There is not a word in the scriptures about the precise day of his birth or the time of the year when he was born. What is recorded there implies that at what time soever his birth took place, 
It could not have been on the 25th of December. Boop. At the time that the angel announced his birth to the shepherds of Bethlehem, they were feeding their flocks by night in the open fields. Now, no doubt, the climate of Palestine is not so severe as the climate of this country. But even there, though the heat of the day be considerable, the cold of the night from December to February is very piercing. And it was not the custom for the shepherds of Judea to watch their flocks in the open fields later than about the end of October. It is in this last degree, it is in the last degree incredible then, that the birth of Christ could have taken place at the end of December. There is great Unanim, unanimity among commentators on this point. There is great unanimity, excuse me, excuse me, unanimity among commentators on this point. I'm very sorry for me stumbling over these words. Please bear with me. Now, the names of these people I'm going to read you, you look these people up. Besides Barnes, Doddridge, Lightfoot, Joseph Scaling, Scaler, Scaler, and Jennings in his Jewish Antiquities, who are all of opinion that December 25th could not be the right time of our Lord's Nativity, the celebrated Joseph Mead pronounces a very decisive opinion to the same effect after a long and careful disquisition on the subject. Among other arguments, he adduces the following. At the birth of Christ, every woman and child was to go to be taxed at the city whereto they belonged, whither some had long journeys. But the middle of winter was not fitting for such a business, especially for women with child and children to travel in. Therefore, Christ could not be born in the depths of winter. Again, at the time of Christ's birth, the shepherds lay abroad watching their flocks in the nighttime, but this was not likely to be in the middle of winter. And if any shall think the winter wind was not so extreme in these parts, let him remember the words of Christ in the gospel. Pray that your flight be not in the winter. And he's referencing Matthew chapter 24, which is talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. If the winter was so bad a time to flee in, it seems no fit time for shepherds to lie in the fields and women and children to travel in. Boop. Hello. Indeed, it is admitted by the most learned and candid writers of all parties that the day of our Lord's birth cannot be determined and that within the Christian church, no such festival as Christmas was ever heard of till the third century. Let me read that again and that within the Christian church, no such festival as Christmas was ever heard of till the third century, and that not till the fourth century was far advanced did it gain much observance. How then did the Romish, Romish church Fix on December the 25th as Christmas Day? Why? Why thus? Long before the 4th century, and long before the Christian era itself, a festival was celebrated among the heathen at, the, at that precise time of the year, in honor of the birth of the son of the Babylonian Queen of Heaven, 
and it may fairly be presumed that, presumed that in order to consolate the heathen and to swell the number of the nominal adherents to Christianity, the same festival was adopted by the, Romish, the Roman church, giving it only the name of Christ. This tendency on the part of Christians to meet paganism halfway was very early developed, and we find Tertullian, even in his day, about the year 230, bitterly lamenting the inconsistency of the disciples of Christ in this respect, and contrasting it with the strict fidelity of the pagans to their own superstitions. By us, says he, who are strangers to Sabbaths and new moons and festivals, once acceptable to God, the Saturnalia, the feasts of January, the Brumala, Brum, Brumalia, and the Matronalia are now frequented. Gifts are carried to and fro, New Year's Day presents are made with din, and sports and banquets are celebrated with uproar. Oh, how much more faithful are the heathen to their religion, who take special care to adopt no solemnity from the Christians. Upright men strove to stem the tide, but in spite of all their efforts, the apostasy went on, till the church, with the exception of a small remnant, was submerged under pagan superstition. That Christmas was originally a pagan festival. That Christmas was originally a pagan festival is beyond all doubt. The time of the year and the ceremonies with which it is still celebrated prove its origin. In Egypt, the sun, Isis, the Egyptian title for the Queen of Heaven, was born at this time, very time, about the time of the winter solstice. The very name by which Christmas is popularly known among ourselves, Yule Day, proves at once its pagan and Babylonian origin. Beg your pardon. Yule is the Chaldee name for infant or little child. And as the and as the twenty fifth of December was called by our pagan Anglo-Saxon ancestors Yule Day, or the Child Day. And the night that preceded it, Mother's Night. Long before they came in contact with Christianity, that sufficiently proves its real character. Far and wide in the realms of paganism, was this birthday observed. This festival had been commonly believed to have had only an astronomical character, referring simply to the completion of the sun's yearly course and the commencement of a new cycle. But there is indisputable evidence that the festival in question had a much higher reference than this, that it commemorated not merely the figurative birthday of the sun in the renewal of its course, but the birthday of the Grand Deliverer. Remember the round, bale, sun-shaped cookie that you Catholics think is Jesus Christ? The birth of the S-U-N, sun? Let's continue. Among the Sabians of Arabia, who regarded the moon and not the sun as the visible symbol of the favorite object of their idolatry, 
The same period was observed as the birth festival. Thus we read in Stanley's Sabian philosophy on the 24th of the 10th month, that is December, according to our reckoning, the Arabians celebrated the birthday of the Lord, that is the moon. The Lord Moon was the great object of Arabian worship, and that Lord Moon, according to them, was born on the 24th of December, which clearly shows that the birth which they celebrated had no, had no necessary connection with the course of the sun. It is worthy of special note, too, that if Christmas Day among the ancient Saxons of this island talking about England, was observed to celebrate the birth of any lord of the host of heaven. The case must have been precisely the same here as it was in Arabia. The Saxons, as is well known, regarded the sun as a female divinity and the moon as a male. It must have been the birthday of the Lord Moon, therefore, and not of the sun that was celebrated by them on the 25th of December. Even as the birthday of the same Lord Moon was observed by the Arabians on the 24th of December, the name of the Lord Moon in the East seems to have been Mene, M-E-N-I. For this appears the most natural interpretation of the divine statement in Isaiah, um, LXV, offhand I can't know, I don't know what that is, uh, verse 11. But ye are they that forsake my holy mountain, that prepare the temple of God, and that furnish the drink offerings unto Mani. There is reason to believe that Gad refers to the sun god, and that Mini, in like manner, des designates the moon divinity. Mani or Menai signifies the numberer, and it is by and it is by the changes of the moon that the months are numbered. Psalm hundred and four nineteen. He appointeth the moon for seasons. The sun knoweth the time of its going down. Uh, if I if I misquoted that, um, I'm not really good on my Roman Roman numerals, so. Bear with me. The name of the man of the moon, or the god who presided over the luminary among the Saxons, was Mane, M A N apostrophe E, as given in the Edda, E D D A, and Manai in the Valuspa. That is that it's that it was the birth of the Lord Moon that was celebrated among our ancestors at Christmas. We have remarkable evidence in the name, in the name that it is, is still given in the lowlands of Scotland to the feast on the last day of the year, which seems to be a remnant of the old birth festival, for the cakes then made are called nur cakes, or birth cakes. That name is Hogam, Hogmanai. Now, Hogmanai in Chaldee signifies the Feast of the Numberer. In other words, the festival of Deus Lunus, or the Man of the Moon, to show the connection between country and country, and the inverate endurance of old customs. It is worthy to remark that Jerome, Commenting on the very words of Isaiah, properly already quoted about spreading a table for Gad and pouring out a drink offering to Mene, observes that it was the custom so late at his time, in the 4th century. In all, cities, in all cities, especially in Egypt and at Alexandria, to set tables and furnish them with various luxurious articles of food and with goblets containing a mixture of new wine, 
on the last day of the month and the year and the year and that the people drew omens from them in respect of the fruitfulness of the year baby new year death of old man you know hello let's continue the Egyptian year began at a different time from ours but this is as near as possible, only substituting whiskey for wine. The, the way in which Hogmany, H-O-G-M-A-N-A-Y, is still observed on the last day of the last month of our year in Scotland. I do not know that any omens are drawn from anything that takes place place at that time but everybody in the south of Scotland is personally cognizant of the fact that on Hogmany or the evening before New Year's Day among those who observe old customs a table is spread and that while buns and other dainties are provided by those who can afford them oat cakes and cheese are brought forth among those who never see oat cakes but on this occasion and that strong drink forms an essential article of the provision. Even where the sun was the favorable object of worship, or excuse me, even where the sun was the favorite object of worship, as in Babylon itself and elsewhere, at this festival he was worshiping not merely the orb of day, but as God incarnate. It was an essential principle of the Babylonian system that the sun or Baal was the one only God. When therefore Tammuz was worshipped as God incarnate, that implies also that he was an incarnation of the sun. Get a load of that one. In the Hindu mythology, which is admitted to be essentially Babylonian. This comes out very distinctly. There, Syra, or S-U-R-Y-A, or the sun, is represented as being incarnate and born for the purpose of subduing the enemies of the gods, who without such a birth could not have been subdued. It was no mere astrom it was no mere astromic festival then that the pagans celebrated at the winter solstice solstice. That festival at Rome was called the Feast of Saturn, and the mode in which it was celebrated there showed whence it had been derived. The feast, as regulated by Caliglia. You look into Caliglia, <laughs> yeah, you go, Romans, lasted five days. Loose reins were given to the drunkenness, uh, loose reins were given to drunkenness and revelry, and revelry, and revelry. Slaves had a temporary emancipation and used all manner of freedoms with their masters. This was precisely the way in which, according to Beros, the drunken festival of the month Thabeth, answering to our December, in other words, the festival of Bacchus, was celebrated in Babylon. It was the custom, he say, says he, during the five days it lasted, for masters to be in subjection to their servants, and one of them ruled the house clothed in purple in a purple garment like a king. This purple-robed servant was called Zoganes, S-Z-O-G-A-N-E-S, the man of sport and wantonness, and answered exactly to the Lord of Misrule. Hmm. And answered exactly to the Lord of Misrule. That in dark ages, that in the dark ages, was chosen in all popish countries to head the revel, the revels of Christmas. The wassailing bowl of Christmas had its precise 
counterpart in the drunken festival of Babylon. And many of and many of the other observance, observances still kept up among ourselves at Christmas came from the very same quarter. The candles in some part of England lighted on Christmas Eve and used so long as the festive seasons lasts were equally lighted by the pagans on the eve of the festival of the Babylonian god to do honor to him. For it was one of the distinguishing peculiar peculiarities of his work of his worship to have lighted wax candles on his altars. Yeah. The Christmas tree, now so common among us, was equally common in pagan Rome and pagan Egypt. In Egypt, that tree was the palm tree. We already looked in Jeremiah chapter 10, so. In Rome, it was the fir, the palm tree denoting the pagan Messiah as Baal Tamar, the fir referring to him as Baal Bereth, the mother of Adonis, the sun god and great meditorial divinity, was mystically said to have been changed into a tree and when in the and when in that state to have brought forth her divine son <laughs> if the mother was a tree the son must have been recognized as the man of the branch see how these devils do this and this entirely accounts for the putting of the Yule log into the fire on Christmas Eve and the appearance of the Christmas tree the next morning, morning as Zero Eshta, the seed of the woman, which name also signifies Ignegina in Ignegina or born of the fire, he has to enter the fire on Mother Night, that he may be born the next day out of it as the branch of God, or the tree that brings all divine gifts to men. But why? It may be asked, does he enter the fire under the symbol of a log? To understand this, it must be remembered that the divine child at the winter solstice was born as a new incarnation of the great God after that after that God had been cut in pieces. Now hold on right there. There's a picture I want to show you. Take a look at that. Okay. Okay. Note the palm tree and the snake around the log. Okay, the palm tree, the snake around the log. I don't know what this is. I'm guessing it might be a fir tree, but look at that. Okay, continuing on. Okay, let's uh, let's read. Uh, continuing on purpose to revenge his death upon his murderers. Now that great God cut off in the midst of his power and glory was symbolized as a huge tree stripped of all its branches and cut down almost to the ground. But the great serpent, the symbol of life, restoring Esculapus, twists itself around the dead stock, which I just showed you. And lo, uh, and lo, at its side up sprouts a young tree, a tree of an entirely different kind that is destined never to be cut down by hostile power, even the palm tree, the well-known symbol of victory. The Christmas tree has been stated. The Christmas tree, as has been stated, was generally at Rome a different tree, even the fir. But the very same idea as was implied in the palm tree was implied in the Christmas fir. For that coverly, for that 
covertly symbolized the newborn God as Baal Bereth, Lord of the Covenant, and thus shadowed forth the perpetual, the per, per, perpetually, perpetually, perpetuity, perpetuity, excuse me, and everlasting nature of his power. Now that after having fallen before his enemies, he had risen triumphant over them all. Therefore, the 25th of December, the day that was observed at Rome as the day when the victorious God reappeared on earth, was held at the Natalis Invicti, Invic Solis, the birthday of the unconquered sun, S-U-N. Now the Yule Log is the dead stock of Nimrod, defied as the, defied as the sun god, deified, excuse me, deified as the sun god, but cut, cut down by his enemies. The Christmas tree is Nimrod Redivius, Redivus, Redivivus, the slain god come to life again. In the light reflected by the above statement on customs that still linger among us, the origin of which has been lost in the midst of hoar antiquities, antiquity, let the reader look at the singular practice still kept up in the South on Christmas Eve of kissing under the mistletoe bow. That mistletoe bow in the Druidic superstition, which as we have seen was derived from Babylon, was a representation of the Messiah, the man, uh, the man, the branch. The man, the branch. The mistletoe was regarded as a divine branch, a branch that came from heaven and grew upon a tree that sprung out of the earth. Thus, by the engrafting of the celestial branch into the earthly tree, heaven and earth that sin had severed were joined together. And thus the mistletoe bow became the token of divine reconciliation to man, the kiss being the well-known token of pardon and reconciliation. Whence could such an idea have come? May it not have come from the 85th Psalm, verse 10, 11, Mercy and truth are met together, righteousness and peace have kissed each other, truth shall spring out of the earth in consequence of coming of the promised Savior, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Certain it is that the psalm was written soon after the Babylonian captivity, and as multitudes of the Jew and as multitudes of the Jews after that event still remained in Babylon under the guidance of inspired men, such as Daniel, as part of the divine word, it must have been communicated to them, as well as to their kinsmen in Palestine. Babylon was, at that time, the center of the civilized world, and thus paganism, corrupting the divine symbol as it ever had done, had opportunities of sending forth its debased counterfeit of the truth to all ends of the earth, through the mysteries, through the mysteries that were affiliated with the great central system in Babylon. Thus, the very customs of Christmas still existent cast surprising light at once on the revelations of grace made to all the earth, and the efforts made by Satan and his emissaries to matter, materialize, carnalize, and degrade them. In many countries, the boar was sacrificed to the god. For the, injury, for the injury a boar was fabled to have done him, 
According to one version of the story of the death of Adonis, or Tammuz, it was, as we have seen, in consequence of a wound from a, the tusk of a boar that he died. The Phrygian Ates, the beloved of Sibyl, whose story was identified with that of Adonis, was fabled to have perished in the manner in like manner by the tusk of a boar. Therefore, Diana, who though commonly represented in popular myths only as the huntress Diana, was in reality the great mother of the gods, has frequently has frequent has frequently the boar's head as her accompaniment, in token not of any mere success in the chase but of her triumph over the grand enemy of the idolatrous system in which she occupied so conspicuous a place. According to Theocritus, Venus was reconciled to the boar that killed Adonis, because when brought in chains before her, it pleaded so pathetically that it had not killed her husband of malice pre, uh, pre, prepense, but only through accident. But yet in memory of the dead that the mystic boar had done, many a boar lost its head or was offered and sacrificed to the offended goddess. In Smith, Diana is represented with a boar's head lying beside her on the top of a head of stones and, is and in the accompanying wood cut Fig 28, and here's a picture. Here's a picture. Okay, right there. This picture. Go ahead and look at that. In which the Roman Emperor Tarjan is represented burning incense to the same goddess. Known today as the Roman Catholic Mary, by the way. The boar's head forms a very prominent figure. On Christmas Day, the continental Saxons offered a boar in sacrifice to the sun to propitiate her for the loss of her beloved Adonis. In Rome, a similar observant, observance had evidently existed. For boar formed the great article at the at the feet of at the feast of Saturn, as appears from the following words of Martel, the boar will make you a good Saturn. Um, the that boar will make you a good Saturnalia. Excuse me. That boar will make you a good Saturnalia. Hence, the boar's head is still a standing dish in England at the Christmas dinner. When the reason of it is long since forgotten, yea, the Christmas goose and Yule cakes were essential articles to the worship of the Babylonian Messiah. And that worship was practiced both in Egypt and at Rome. Figure 29, right here. Right here. See that? Get a good look at it. Wilkinson, in reference to Egypt, shows that the favorite offering of Osiris was a goose, and moreover that the goose could not be eaten except in the depth of winter. Oh, beg your pardon. As to Rome, Javunela, J-U-V-E-N-A-L, Javulna, says that Osiris is offered if that if, beg your pardon, that Osiris, if offended, could be pacified only by a large goose and a thin cake. In many countries, we have evidence of a sacred K 
character attached to the goose. It is well known that the capital of Rome was on one occasion saved when on the point of being surprised by the Gauls in the dead of night by the cackling of the geese sacred to Juno kept in the temple of Jupiter. The accompanying woodcut, Fig 30, which is on the opposing page, right there. See that? Proves that the goose in Asia Minor was the symbol of Cupid, just as it was the symbol of Seb in Egypt. Isis horse Seb, IHS. What is IHS significant on to? I'll let you figure that one out. In India, the goose occupied a similar position, for in that land we read of the sacred Raha Brahmani goose, or goose sacred to Brahma. Finally, the monuments of Babylon show that the goose possessed a like mystic character in Chaldea and that it was offered in sacrifice there, as well as in Rome or Egypt. For there the priest is seen with the goose in the one hand and his sa sacrificing knife in the other. There can be no doubt then that the pagan festival at the winter solace, in other words, Christmas, was held in honor of the birth of the Babylonian Messiah. The consideration of the next great, great festival in the Popish calendar gives the very strain, strongest confirmation to what has now been said. That festival called Lady Day is celebrated at Rome on the 25th of March, an alleged commemoration of the miraculous conception of our Lord in the womb of the capital V Virgin. On the day when the angel was sent to announce to her the distinguished honor that was to be bestowed upon her as the mother of the Messiah. But who could tell when this annunciation was made? The scripture gives no clue at all in regard to this time, but it mattered not. Before our Lord was either conceived or born, that very day now set down in the Popish calendar for the, for the Annunciation of the Virgin was observed in pagan Rome in honor of Sybil, the mother of the Babylonian Messiah. Now it is manifest that Lady Day and Christmas Day stand in intimate relation to one another between the 25th of March and the 25th of December. There are exactly nine months. If then, the false Messiah was conceived in March and born in December, can anyone for a moment believe that the conception and birth of the true Messiah can have so exactly synchronized not only to the month, but to the day? This thing is incredible. Lady Day and Christmas Day, then, are purely Babylonian. Are purely Babylonian, just like Easter. And if I were to continue reading, it would be about Easter, which I have two videos talking about Easter. Dear friends, Christmas, Christmas, is pagan. From the tree to the date, it is pagan. It is Babylonian. 
Mystery Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots and Abominations of the Earth, Roman Catholicism. Okay? Christmas is a pagan holiday. Brethren, it is not founded upon the scriptures. Not at all. But there's something that comes up now. Okay? Now, Christmas is a pagan holiday. Okay? I'm sorry. You know, you've seen things keep Christ in Christ Mass. <laughs> he was never in it. Not the true Jesus Christ, God our Father of the Scriptures. But there's comes something else. There comes something else up that we that I want to address with you. Go to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. <clears throat> Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall, he shall be holden up. For God is able to make him stand. For today, you can eat pork. Okay? Okay, that's in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Go look that up on your own time. Okay? The dietary restrictions under the law are not there for us today in this dispensation. If, if you want to observe that, go right ahead. Knock yourself out. It's not a requirement for you. Okay? I used to be a vegan, by the way. I used to be a vegan. And I had no problem with anyone who wanted to eat burgers, bacon, that kind of stuff. I'm no longer a vegan anymore, just so you know. Or if someone just wants to eat vegetable or, or just herbs or whatever. Uh, look, I can't judge you by what you eat. Okay? If you want to, granted, not, not getting in about the GMO stuff and whatnot like that, that's a different subject. But... If, you, if you're a vegan, if you want to be vegan and stay away from all animal products, go ahead. I'm not going to. Go ahead. I'm not going to hold that against you. I'm not. If you want to go ahead and eat pork, lamb, whatever, shellfish, uh, spiders, whatever. Don't know why you'd want to eat that, but whatever. Whatever you want to eat, go ahead. Go ahead. You can't judge someone for what they're eating. Deal with the scriptures. Okay? Now let's continue. Now here's, here's, the, here's the tricky thing. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. Giving thanks unto the Lord. The one day esteemed above another. Okay? Now we are to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, every day, every day, okay, every single day, amen, amen, and give praise unto him. But one man esteemeth one day above another, 
Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. If you want to say use Monday as a day where you just shut everything off and spend the entire day worshiping, you know, praying, speaking unto the Lord, going to Him in, um, you know, contrition and praise, go right ahead. If you want to do it Tuesday, if you want to do it Thursday, if you, if you want to keep the Sabbath, go ahead. It's not a requirement for salvation or to be right with God or to stay saved. I've already addressed that. If you want to keep the Sabbath, go ahead. Knock yourself out. If you want to uh, do your thing on Sunday, go ahead. But remember, ye are the temple of the living God. You know, God dwells within you. God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Uh, guess what, friend? You're in church 24-7. Not the building. You're in church 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. If you are saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God. Okay? Okay? Let's continue. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. Now, but why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the church of the living God. Not you who are fake or who are who are, uh, those of you who are lost, excuse me. But see, now the judgment, talking about diet and what day you esteem above another as worship and praise unto our Lord. Okay, how do you know it's for that? Verse 7, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. Okay? Let's continue. Verse 11, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself, to God. Let us not therefore judge one another. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Keep reading. Okay? Keep reading. He's not giving place to relativism for the... Keep reading. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, with thy meat, uh, unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. It's not talking about, like, you know, well, you know, adultery is not unclean to me. Might be to you. You know, murder is not unclean to me. It might not be to you. No, that's not what he's talking about. What is he talking about? But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat. That's what it's talking about. Thank you. Okay? Now walkest thou not charitably. Self-sacrifice. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Example. A Jew who is truly saved, born again and converted of the church of the living God, who struggles with you know, that he doesn't have to, to be right with God, to be saved and stay saved. He doesn't have to keep the dietary law. 
but has been raised in his family under the Jewish tradition, okay, that he has to remain kosher today in order to be right with God. But once he gets saved, he realizes, I don't have to do that in order to stay saved or be right with God. If he wants to, go ahead. Okay, go right ahead. But, okay, if he doesn't, and he's struggling with it, you, as a Gentile, how are you going to be charitable being with a Jewish man or woman, ladies, um, if you're going to be eating a big old pulled pork sandwich with good barbecue sauce and mayonnaise, never mind, in front of someone who's struggling with that? You see, you see what I mean? You get it? Let's continue. Verse 16, let not then your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that is, for he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherein one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but, to, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. You know, if somebody comes over, and they're vegetarian, okay, and they have a problem, and they are of the church of the living God, not letting them into our house here if they're not, okay, okay, um, and they have a, you know, I've got the ribeyes on the stove or something like that, and he's like, or and he's like, uh, uh, it's like, okay, I'll make some rice and broccoli or something like that. I can do a vegetarian. I'm not going to do that, you know. Now you're not walking charitably. But if you're going to be brazen, it's like, oh, why aren't you eating meat? Huh? Why aren't you eating that pork? You know you can. What's wrong with you? You know? You know what I'm saying? Let's continue. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, stumbleth or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Now the question is, verses 5 and verse 6. You got to remember, all things are lawful unto me, but not all things are expedient. Do you have liberty as the church of the living God to observe Christmas? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. The context of verse 5 and 6, dearly beloved, okay, is about worship. Okay, praise, giving one day unto the Lord specifically, you know, where the church, the body meet together, you know. Do you have liberty to celebrate to celebrate Christ Mass? All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful unto me, but all things edify not. On a personal note, I'm not going to hold it against anyone of the Church of the Living God who wants to observe Christmas. I will probably have not want to you know, 
uh, go with you or join with you in that? Most definitely not. Um, I know Brother Brian, um, he celebrates Christmas. Not the paganism of it, but then again, I'm not, I'm not going to get into that. Okay. Brother Brian is a saved man. I know that there are those out there who, of the Church of the Living God, do observe certain things of Christmas. Okay? Be careful with your liberty. Because Christmas, beloved, is pagan. And I will go on record to tell you that if you are attributing something onto Jesus Christ, God our Father, that is proven pagan, how do you think he's going to feel about that? You know what I'm saying? And don't give me this thing about the Christmas spirit. Yeah. We do not observe Christmas. We don't. Okay? You know, if someone's like, says to me, Brad, Merry Christmas, and I'm not going to take my scripture as like, uh, uh, infidel, infidel. No, I'm not. Like, hey, thanks. I'm, please don't get offended. I'm not going to wish that curse back upon you. Okay? But I do know also that it used to be that um, this time a lot of people were more open to hear the gospel, which is something that Brother Brian touched on in his one video he did a year ago where he stood in front of a Christmas tree. The message of his video was spot on. I got what he was saying. But there again, you know, like I said, I, I'm, you know, that's, that's his thing. Okay. That's his thing. Ugh. Okay. But um, it used to be people were a little bit more receptive to hearing about the Lord Jesus Christ, God, our father and the gospel. Now, with the COVID stuff, not so much. Okay? It's between you and the Lord, brethren, to be honest with you, um, if you're going to celebrate Christmas. Again, and again, if you do, I'm not attacking you. If you are my brother, my sister, and you're like, well, Brad, I, I celebrate Christmas. Um, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to join you in your celebration, of course, because it's pagan. I'm not. I'm not. Okay? I'm not going to do that. But you need to at least understand that it is of pagan or origin. Jesus Christ was not born on the 25th. The 25th is linked to Saturnalia, directly onto Babylon and the worship of pagan gods. Okay? That at least understand. Okay? And if you know that, why continue? I'm not saying. I'm just saying. Okay? Again, I'm not, if, if, if you're a brother, if you give me an email or say something about this, it's like, oh! Oh, you're going to be like, oh, they come to me uh, about Christmas and you think I'm going to be like, oh, heretic. No, 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 um, that, that one's on you. 
Okay? That one's on you. Okay? It is. So. Anyway, that's going to be it for this video. Um, like I said, a brother had asked me about this. Hopefully this answers your question. And for those of you out there, um, like I said, Christmas is pagan. Christmas is pagan. It's not in the scriptures. The opposite. You know, Lord's Supper, self-examination, a day where you uh, remember what he did for you. Not his birth. Okay? So, that's going to be it for this video. And very, very quickly, very quickly. I don't do this to purposely offend you. I don't. You, 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 you got to know from whence this thing came from. Okay? You have to know from whence Christmas came from. And my... Oh, don't believe these people, the Catholics, for what they say. Please. Okay? Anyway, that's going to be it for this video. Um, thank you for watching. If you do, I love you, and I will see you in the next video.